Hello and welcome to another episode of the 1020 podcast. Today I'm talking to Elbridge A. Colby. Mr. Colby is the author of The Strategy of Denial, American Defense in an Age of Great Power Conflict, which was published in 2021 by Yale University Press. Mr. Colby is also the initiator and founder of the Marathon Initiative, a Washington-based think tank that deals with the question of great power competition in the 21st century. Based on the theory of realism, Mr. Colby has developed a an intriguing and persuading theory of how the 21st century might develop in terms of international relations, how the United States have to separate their attention as well as their resources between the Atlantic and the Pacific, and what this can mean for the prospect of war in the future and how to avoid it. His writing has appeared in Time and the Wall Street Journal. He's a regular guest on several news outlets, including Tucker Carlson, Fox News, and other stations. Other stations. So I would really like to start talking to you about your 2021 book, Strategy of Denial, uh, for several reasons. First of all, I think it is written in a fantastically accessible way. So it really falls into the category. It reminded me a little bit something that you quote uh, John Mersheimer's uh, most recent book. Um, I think it really falls into this idea that we have to focus again on actual strategy and kind of get away a little bit from, from philosophical dreams into actual strategy. It's it's very detailed it's greatly footnoted so i have already assigned it to one of my intermediate classes in the graduate program and an advanced class in the undergrad program because it's really applied strategy but of course i have to start with the first question so what's the denial you're talking about well thanks ralph it's great to be with you and i appreciate that's exactly what i hope to achieve so so i'm delighted that, that you, you found it uh, kind of uh, that you you see it that way thank you um what is denial? Well, denial, I would say it has maybe three meanings, uh, two that are in the book. And one was, was uh, uh, actually a, a radio interview I was doing in, uh, with California, a guy in California pointed this out. The first denial is the denial of reality. It's the, that's the one that's not in the book, but in a sense is implicit, which is exactly as you point out, the sort of the end of the end of history idea. That's the sort of, we need to get over that denial of the reality of history and strategy. Um, and of course, actually, right now, I would say there's a resurgence of that mindset that I think is uh, very worrying, actually, because it's a little bit strange that, that that mindset is having a resurgence, actually, when the facts of the matter are so um, discordant with that way of looking at the world. If anything, I think that what's happening right now is actually reinforcing the way that we need to look that, that I think you and I are talking about. The second form of denial is, is you know, where I try to think about what America's geopolitical approach should be. And that fundamental goal is a, is a, is a geopolitical goal of, of denial, which is denial of another state hegemony over one of the world's key market areas, which are basically clustered in a couple of regions, primarily sort of East and South, South, Southeast Asia, and then Europe. And then the, the, the third meaning, which is what mo most of the book is, is taken up with, is a military goal of denial, which is, which is the, the, the defense planning standard uh, particularly in Asia, but for U.S. alliances generally, which ideally, whether by the United States or the U.S. working with its allies or, or primarily allies, uh, which is which is to deny um, our opponents the ability to uh, consummate their their theory of victory, particularly to seize and hold the territory of states connected to us by uh, uh, an alliance commitment, or in the case of Taiwan, a quasi alliance commitment, which is basically if you can do that you're basically in a position where, where that state can, can continue to be part of your alliance network. And actually right now, we're seeing the, the incredible political effect that denial uh, has on the, on the sort of the strategic and diplomatic situation because of the enormous courage of the Ukrainians. It's not our doing uh, other than providing support, but it, I think it's a, a, a sort of a, 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 a sort of, uh, Vindication, uh, or sort of a, a reflection of the importance of denial uh, for for strategic uh, results. If you would have to put a pin into it, when do you think does this this period of denial kind of start? Do you think it's a little bit like a, a hangover from the optimism of the '90s, or would you say it might even start a little bit earlier? Kind of, if you would have to to name a date or a, 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 you know a time period where, where it kind of starts to emerge, which time would I think it's 1989? Place? I think in the Cold War. I mean, I think the United States has always had a sort of missionary or sort of messianic element. I mean, there's a famous book by Walter McDougall, McDougall called "A Promised Land" or "Crusader State," and if you go back to Woodrow Wilson and so forth. But you know, with some exceptions, like 
you know, FDR and the sort of early Truman years, you know, that was definitely cabined within certainly in the, in the post post-war period during the cold war by a, you know, it's a, a very sound geopolitical approach. It wasn't always perfectly applied in my view, but that it was controlled. Um, but, it, but it was the, it was the collapse of the Soviet union, the apparent sort of, you know, I mean, I think the perception that, that the American and kind of Western approach and particularly a variant of that, the sort of, you could sort of, sort of say the high liberal uh, sort of view of the world uh, had been completely vindicated. And of course there was no peer challenger uh, the other potential challengers were all too weak for one reason or another. And so I always, I, I like to say that we need to get over 1991 or 1992 in the new world order of thinking. It's not the post-war uh, perspective. In, in a lot of ways, we need to go back to post-war, kind of Cold War. I mean, it's always sort of a canard, but I'm not saying we should go back to the Cold War in all its respects, but we should certainly go back to the Cold War in the, in the, in the level of seriousness we, we thought about strategy and military affairs with. And and abandon the, the mindset on both the right and the left in the United States of the 1990s and 2000s. I mean, you know, George W. Bush's second inaugural is one of the most dramatic, uh, you know, uh, sort of, I mean, endless goals, um, you know, almost the transformation of human nature in, in, in some sense. So, um, or certainly human society. So I think that's that, that kind of mindset we really need to get, get beyond. I mean, when we look at like, and you just mentioned like the early 90s, we had on the one hand, you know, the famous essay by Francis Fukuyama about the end of history. We had Charles Krautthammer's The Unipolar Moment. I mean, would it be fair in hindsight to say that these 10 years, like let's say from 1991 to 9-11 to usually is kind of the, the first way mark where, where the idea was that things change, that this really has been a historical exception and that there was this mindset that what is actually an exception was perceived as the new norm. And that this then kind of accumulated into the kind of problems we're facing right now while we're talking. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think, I think it's pretty clear now. And, and of course, sort of geopolitical minded realists took a, took a lot of knocks in those years, but I think they were right that it, in a sense, it was a sort of quote unquote holiday from history. And that doesn't mean we need to live in a world of, of major wars. I mean, God forbid the whole point of this book, my book is to avoid that outcome. But we have to take it very seriously. And I think you mentioned two sort of critical thinkers. I mean, Fukuyama's book, as you know as well as I do, is obviously more nuanced and, and uh, than, than its common sort of reception. Although Fukuyama himself, I've actually I was kind of disappointed. I have a lot of respect for him, but I, but his recent comments on the Ukraine situation, I thought, were almost a cartoonish version of his own arguments. So you know, I I was struck by that. And then Krauthammer is more this sort of you know unipolarity will exist forever. And I think. I mean, partially because of people like Charles Krauthammer, may he rest in peace, we, our, our period of unipolarity was a lot shorter than it might be. If we pursued the kinds of strategies, in my view, that, that I'm advocating, we would have had a, uh, a strong position, you know, or a uniquely strong position probably for much longer. But I think if we go back a lot of the areas from the 90s, I think the, the early 2000s or most of the 2000s, we made a number of, of dramatically disastrous choices. You know, if, if I think back, I mean, I think the decision to bring China into the WTO and the international economic system without compelling them to make changes and, and follow the rules was a, was a dramatic error. Uh, it was kind of a, a bipartisan error in our case. The decision to invade Iraq and to expand uh, on, rather than a kind of punitive mission against Al Qaeda and the Taliban to sort of a transformational mission in the Middle East, that was a second fundamental error. I mean, the, the, the economic policies that led to the financial crisis, I'm not an economist, but I mean, QED, it was disastrous. So, I mean, these, these, these things contributed, uh, were probably the primary factors that contributed to the, you know, unnecessarily short period of our, of our ascendancy, or I mean, we're still ascendant in a lot of ways, but, but I think caused a lot more problems than we were. And what's sort of striking now is that many of the same people are in prominent positions and making arguments that would just worsen, <laughs> that would just worsen the problem. I mean, geez, if you're in a hole, stop digging. But, you know, here we are. That's what I'm trying to do. Do you think that this even got worse with 9-11? With I mean, this is, this is a little bit of a different way for us to look back at it. But as you say, kind of there was this optimism of the 90s. Then you had 9-11. And then you mentioned George W. Bush, right? Then there was the idea, yeah, there are still problems in the world, but it's mostly because, you know, domestically people have grievances or it, it's, you know, it's, it's a poverty problem or it's a development problem. But the idea what you, of course, describe in your book and what also the Marathon Initiative works with is the idea of a return of great power conflict. So we're not talking about 
you know, non-state actors that, that can conduct you know, horrific um, uh, terrorist uh, attacks. We talk about actual competition between major states that, of course, have all the capacities and organizational potency of, of a modern state. That, that, and, and again, everything we talk here, I mean, the situation with China, I mean, this was happening in the background, but it seems in the 90s, focus was on everything is great, right? Then in the 2000s, everything was on it's not great, but it's just minor things, right? The, you know, you go into the Middle East, democratization, you spread liberalization, and, and then things will finally work out. And it seems that we completely lost sight, which is now coming back on the fact, no, no, there, there is still state competition as well. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you said it very well. And I think, um, you know, most of it has to do, in my view, with power, you know, that if there's an, you know, in theory, you could have a non-state entity that could wield that much power, but in reality, you don't, because the state, a state is by definition, a entity that has monopoly control over territory and population and can use the productive capacity of that population. So in practice, we're talking about states. Non-state actors are, can be very, very dangerous, but they kind of leech off the state system and inherently the states have more power to try to deal with them. And so the notion that non-state, and this was a very deliberate, certainly in my book, but also in the National Defense Strategy of 2018, focusing on states because focusing on power, and power is what eventually turns into violence and coercive leverage and so forth. That's then you care about states. And so, you know, I mean, I think realism, you know, broadly construed, not necessarily one particular strain of it, has been highly vindicated by the last few years and watching China, which, you know, essentially is the one of the best test cases probably we've ever had of, a, of an enormously powerful state that said it was going to rise peacefully and follow the Deng Xiaoping model and all that, and has completely shifted off of that. And I think, you know, um, we would have been much better off if we had said, you know, kind of trust but verify and hold them to account. And, you know, this is going to be a very powerful, powerful state. And so whatever they're saying now, you know, we should, we should take account of that. And, um, you know, now it's become sort of, you know, in the, in the, in the ether, at least in the United States, the great power competition is, is a thing, but we're pretty late, pretty late to need. So, but, you know, now we have to make the best of it. One of the things, another core topic of your book, of course, is uh, the shift of the focus to the Pacific and, and, and Asia. So it's a, which of course pains me as a European extremely, I feel horribly neglected in your book. <laughs> but, uh, it's not always good to be the focus of our attention, I gotta tell you. Sometimes it's better to be the secondary theater. <laughs> probably, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. to be a little bit out of the limelight. Which exactly. Kind of, given because of population, of economic power, that's really what the United States should should focus on. So how do you envision, as you correctly said, right there, there's, there's kind of, Really, a little bit of a China buzz also in the U.S. media, right? This realization that this is the great, uh, the great competitor. So, what is the strategy that you suggest? Uh, because, as you mentioned, right, the goal, of course, is to avoid war. I think it's very important to mention. The goal is not here to say this is how we we beat China into submission by military means. It's exactly the opposite. So, which which process, which strategy are you outlining in, in your book? Well, I think that's a really important point, especially to European audiences. Is, is realpolitik has a has a bad name, uh, uh, a bad odor in in the sort of post war period. But you know, my view is if you you know if you don't want to live in a mocked politik world, and that's the battle limit limit of my German, but unfortunately, but you have to think in realpolitik terms, right? Which is you have to think about how bad guys, quote unquote, might behave and and array their incentives accordingly. But if you live in a world of, you know, I mean, not to be too, but if you kind of live in a Tony Blinken world, you know, then the then the 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 the, the bad guys will will take advantage. And I'm not trying to be reductive, sort of cowboy here, but the notion is that you're best likely to get uh, peace and stability on good terms if you thought through uh, how 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 things might go badly and then accounted for that. So that's the that's the basic logic, and I think. I actually think, and this is a point I think is important to stress right now, there's a lot of moral fervor in the air. And of course there should be given, you know, the abominable invasion of Ukraine by uh, Putin, but the moral people are not the ones who are the ones who moral, beat the drum the most, because often those people are not accounting for the, the consequences and, and they're actually often their, their prescribed uh, recommendations would leave us worse off and have more people die. My view is that the morality of realism is not purely consequentialist in a kind of philosophical sense, but it's basically statecraft. The, the, the measure of statecraft is the consequences, the results of your policies. 
And if you are a person of, uh, you know, perfect moral intent, but your policies lead to disaster, you, you are bad. That is a bad act. So like Woodrow Wilson, I'm sure he had positive policies, but the outcome of his policies were very bad. And he is morally responsible for that. If you take on, and this, you know, I mean, the famous statement of this is Max Weber and politics is a vocation, but I, you know, I, I, I recoil very fervently against the notion that realism is immoral. To the contrary, I think it's more moral than, than this kind of crusading zeal because crusading zeal leads to worst outcomes and statecraft should be accountable for outcomes. So, but in terms of what's the strategy, well, the strategy in that in line of that way of thinking, the strategy in Asia is essentially balancing, which is to say, if you have a power that could become too powerful, then you need to work with others to check its aspirations and present it with an, a set of incentives that will be, um, uh, will make, make sure, say to make likely that it, it is persuaded that aggression or other things are not in its interests. And so that's, you know, where I come from what I call an anti-hegemonic coalition. It's, it's a negatively defined, uh, you know, group. It's, it's essentially, a, it's, it's, it's a heuristic, it's a model. It's not, a, it's not actually going to necessarily be a thing. I actually don't think we should even try to create an Asian NATO. I think it wouldn't be worth it. Better to put our efforts elsewhere. Um, there might be kind of rudiments or elements of, of a sort of an alliance structure, but really we want to work with states that are, you know, are, are willing and able to deny China's regional hegemony, uh, you know, uh, work with them effectively to, to deny that outcome. But the problem is that's easier said than done. And, and China is very powerful and has ways of, um, of, of trying to, to, to pursue its goals uh, in ways that could frustrate our, 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 our attempt to, to deny it, that, that goal. And you mentioned a couple of, of key players in this in this uh, kind of group of states that would help the United States to, to kind of balance the hegemonic aspirations of China. So if we look a little bit at the news as it happened in the last couple of weeks, I mean, all of the days, so much kind of fog of war and, and you know, there, there's there's so much, you know, it, it's, you know, China is delivering weapons to Russia. No, they don't. And, and Lavrov flies to China, then he turns. So it's very hard at the moment to say what's really going on. But if, if we try to, or if we just for the sake of the question, assume a trend, right? I think now Saudi Arabia seems to slightly move uh, towards China, although again, they, they are not necessarily in an area that, that features very prominently in your book. But also India is it's kind of it looks like that that India does not fully agree with just kind of you know, being a, a chess piece in somebody else's uh, grand strategy. And, and I mean, I fully agree with your grand strategy, but that's of course also because as a European. I think having the United States around as the benevolent hegemon is something that I directly profit from. So this is not a selfish, uh, you know, support. This is something I profit from as well. So, so, so what if, if to some extent, Beijing kind of also turns it around and tries to build its own counterbalancing uh, or anti-hegemonic um, quasi alliance towards the United States? Well, in fact, I think that will happen. I, I call it the pro-hegemonic coalition. I think what you're talking about, actually, to me, what's happening is actually vindicating my approach because essentially my approach is based on the idea that states will tend to act in their own interests and particularly you know, in their security domain, they will look at their, their immediate threats and prioritize accordingly. And so you know, there, there's obviously in Europe, but also in the American media, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of attention on Ukraine and, and elsewhere um, but there's a tendency to, to I think, to, to hear more of what is coming out of Europe than of what is coming out of other parts of the world. And actually what's happening is, I think, an illustration, you know, one of the key arguments that I've made against the administration's policy since it came into office was, I think, that their notion of an alliance of democracies or kind of a three musketeers approach that it's like this essentially crusader state, which is going to work with all the other alliances, no matter where they are, because ideology is what matters and rules-based international order, or, you know, whatever Secretary Blinken and others are saying that they will come together and whether you're New Zealand or the Netherlands or Japan, you'll all come together. But that's not what's happening. What's happening, if you look at it practically, is the European states are stepping up because they perceive a threat that they probably inadequately appreciate. And they're the ones who are levying the most significant sanctions. They're the ones building up defense. Uh, uh, U.S. partners and allies in other regions are, it's a more complicated story. Israel has taken a kind of a middle position. Well, for right, they have relations with Russians. They have problems in Syria. They need the Russians on the Iran issue, potentially. There's a lot of other reasons. That you mentioned the Saudis and the Emiratis as well. They're kind of looking at, you know, Iran is their big problem. The Russians are reality they have to deal with. 
Um, you know, the Americans are less, they rightly assess the Americans will be less involved in the Middle East over time, I think. India, India is very, very tight with us. We've never had a tighter relationship with India, but that's about China. And the Indians have not budged on their deep alignment. I mean, their, their longest standing ally is really Moscow. They buy significant military equipment and you know, they buy other things from them. And thus far, they've assessed that that's their, that's their approach. And of course, it's the world's largest democracy. And even like Japan, you know, Japan has gone along with some of the sanctions. I, think it's, I don't think it's gone along with all of the sanctions on Russia. Because again, Japan's problems are primarily China, of course, and then North Korea. So to me, what this says is we need a differentiated approach across theaters based on the interests and capabilities of our allies. So instead of saying, India, do exactly what we want on the Russia thing, because we're all in this together all the time, say, India, you focus on China, and I guess Pakistan, which is probably effectively part of China's pro-hegemonic coalition. And then, look, we're gonna have different things on the Russia issue, but you know, we'll make our points, but we're not gonna cause a fissure in the, in the partnership over it, which is insane, because India, like sanctioning the Indians over purchasing Russian military equipment is crazy. I mean, because we can't afford to like alienate the Indians. And I mean, they, you know, they, they need us too, but it's like, what's our priority here, <laughs> right? And our priority is China. China is 10 times the size of, Russian, of the Russian economy. I mean, it's just a totally different, and nothing, nothing has changed about China in the last three weeks. So like suddenly people are saying that Putin is the biggest threat and he's a nasty guy, as I've said on Paris Fora. He's a, clearly, he's not a good person to say the least. But if power is what matters, China has a lot more power than Russia. I mean, there's another book, I think, that deals really well with yours, right? That's kind of Rosh Doshi's The Long Game about, about the Chinese strategy. And the reason why I bring it up is, at least his argument is one, that the Chinese, since the 70s, have more or less formulated, also how you describe it in your book, right? Grand strategy is not a, a chain of steps, right? It's not like a diet where, you know, you eat cabbage right. on Monday and carrots on Tuesday. But it's, <laughs> it's a framework. It's a framework, is exactly as you said, right? When you have a conflict with Russia, and again, you look at India, you say, you know, we need India as a partner to counterbalance China. You're not going to put sanctions on India then because they don't put sanctions on Russia. So it's, it's right. a framework within which you operate. But exactly. what worries me is, and this is just kind of to, to I feel like I'm name dropping all the time, but it, it just happens. Sir. This was something that Neil Ferguson mentioned mm -hmm. uh, related to the Iraq. Conflict. We have an attention deficit in the West. And what, I, what, what he means by this, right, kind of these conflicts, these things happen, but then they almost seem to get boring at, at some point. And it, my, my worries you described by also now the Europeans, right? The Europeans now conflict in Ukraine. So Germany says, yeah, we're gonna increase, like we double deficit spending, a hundred billion. So this all sounds, I agree with you, right? This, this now, now you, you, you crash with reality and then you have to act. But my fear is what even, this is what I fear on the European side, right? That as soon as things tend to get a little better, right? That it reverts to the previous thing kind of, you know, well, this was really bad, but as we said before, but that was the abnormality. So that then again, this mindset, the 90s are the rule and everything else is the abnormality. So when things go back to normal, right? We also, we say, yeah, we remember what we said about those 2% of GDP, but actually it's only gonna be one or, you know, they're gonna then diversify it in, in you know, some whatever than the Germans, you know, some pension fund or, or something else. And also in the case of the United States, um, as you described, but right, there has this been this idea, you said this beautifully before, if you say, well, we're going to be the moral leadership, that that's where the strategy ends. It's kind of that then the entire world is going to say, well, if, if they are the moral leadership, then, then, then of course. <laughs> right. have to decide. Oh, so, well then, okay. Right, yeah, right. well then, so there is, there's nothing else to say. <laughs> so I, I'm so afraid that, that, that there is, that's exactly what you and the Marathon Initiative tried to do, right? Say, no, no, there needs to be a, a long-term framework. In, in, in a certain sense, you know, it, it's a, uh, Again, it, it's it's this 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 unwillingness, right, to to think of the long term. It's kind of what I'm building up to is why would we want to be the hegemon? I think in in the Chinese case, we can give an answer, right? Even in the Russian case, for, for everything they do, right, which is not condoning it, but it you can put it into an ideological box that is understandable. So you know, you want to be the the, the new you know tsarist, whatever. So okay, then you right. do this. It's horrible, but you can say okay, that makes sense. <coughs> China. <clears throat> seems to have, as they call it, right, this, this remembrance of the, 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 the century of humiliation after the opium wars. So, so this is something I can emotionally understand. 
But why do we want to, like, like what drives us? What drives the West? What drives the United States to be the hegemon? Okay, well, no, I mean, you said it very well. So I, I'll just kind of comment on, I mean, I think just on the Europeans, I think it's the end of history idea is more dominant in my experience. It's much more dominant in Europe than it is in other parts of the world. So but the European like Union the Jap- is basically the European Union is basically the institutionalization of the end of history. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the self conception. I don't think it actually is in reality, but that's the attempt. And you know, I mean, Fukuyama is going back to Koyev and all. The, I mean, there's this has been in part of the the roots of it. Um, you know, this attempt to establish, I guess, some some combination of liberalism and, and, and sort of a constructed sort of, uh, you know, identity and so forth and reality. Um, and we, we could talk about that. But, I, you know, I don't, in my experience, you know, certainly in the Middle East, of course, but also in Asia, it's not like, the, it doesn't mean that they're thinking in sort of Bismarckian terms, but it does, I, I don't think there's this idea that, that war is impossible and that, you um, you know, tensions are, are, are sort of, uh, anyway, I think you know what I mean, but I, but I would say that, it, and in the United States, I mean, I don't, the end of history idea, I mean, there was always an, there was always a sense, it, it, I, I, don't, I don't think the sort of pacifistic elements, you know, were as rooted, because the lesson, I mean, I'm always struck by, um, there was a, a great book by Tony Jute, uh, I don't know if you, the, the historian, uh, American Squirrel, I think he's read originally, but um, there's a, his his book post war, which is this magisterial history, which all Americans should read in post war Europe. It's kind of obvious to European, but for Americans, I remember the cover photo was just very illuminating, and it's a cover photo of like a bombed out, I think German city uh, after the war. And it just one of the key the key argument of the book is like how Europeans understood the lessons of the war and so forth, and and how they internalized it. So I mean, it goes back obviously before. 89, 91, but 89, 91 is sort of, I think it's like almost this apotheosis of a particular interpretation of the post-war period, which is the war is awful, obviously, but like it is an abhorrent act which needs to be kind of banned and you need this institutionalization exactly as you as you said, which was not necessarily what Conrad Adenauer or Charles de Gaulle or Winston Churchill thought, but became, especially with the 68 generation, became particularly ascendant. That 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 was not the lesson that Americans took, rightly or wrongly, from World War II, which is kind of more the you know Munich is bad, you have to stand up for freedom. The kind of um, that that sort of mentality was more dominant, rightly or wrongly. But but I think that's sort of an important difference, uh, and in, in a particularity of Europe, that also I mean, there's a sort of moralistic. Uh, rhetoric, especially on a continent that's that's just not in, not sort of as ascendant in other parts of the world. I mean, I always when I talk with Asian audiences, th- there's much more comfort with just kind of talking about national interest and the kind of geopolitical aspects of things. And of course, in the Middle East as well, it's sort of a different tune. But anyway, I mean, I think that um, why does America want them? I don't think America should be the hegemon. I mean, I only think we should be the hegemon insofar as our hegemonic status is necessary to deny another state the hegemonic position. So in, in effect, we will have to be the basically kind of like the quasi hegemon of our block. I mean, I think basically likely what we're moving towards unless the Chinese completely face plan economically, is it is it a two block geo, geoeconomic and sort of geopolitical systems with significant crossover, unlike in the, in the, in the, in the Cold War. So I think like with, with, with Saudi is probably a good example that Saudi's not, I don't think they're going to completely abandon the United States. I hope they don't. I hope we don't let them. But I think they'll be playing both sides a bit more. And that will be possible for a variety of reasons, but because there's a lot more commercial interchange across the barrier. Um, so, you know, if, I mean, I think America, we would be perfectly happy and free if, if somebody, you know, I mean, and we were for the first century, century plus of our existence, we free rode over Britain's role, you know, in checking. Uh, you know, first I, guess, I suppose French, and then and then uh, and then German pretensions to to dominance of the world's then critical theater. But they're not. Nobody else is strong enough to do it. So essentially, that's like kind of how I. You know, it, it, I don't believe that America has a sort of messianic mission in the world. That it's our. You know, we should be the global policeman. That we need to be. A, you know, always in. You know, asserting ourselves everywhere. I think we just need to deny any other state so much power that they could impose their will 
way on us and we can work in an enlightened self-interest way with others. But that to me leads to a different way of thinking than has been dominant. Um, you know, almost like this sort of, we need to be a leader or the dominant power or the superpower for its own sake. Like, I don't think the founding fathers actually even thought we should be a superpower, but we are a superpower. And, you know, if we don't act like a superpower, we won't, we won't have the world, we won't have the world that we want or the, the, the international environment that we want at home. So I think that's how I look at it. If we look at the states, I mean, the, the United States on the one hand, China on the other hand, and maybe we can throw Russia a little bit into this mix as well. Um, one thing that seems to still distinguish the United States from all these other potential or actual uh, competitors is that domestically, for all its you know political polarization and the culture wars, and, and which you know which is fun if you spend time on Twitter, but <laughs> the United States still have tremendous energy, right? I mean, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to to you know creating new things, but a lot of this is is still happening in the United States. So the power, kind of the domestic power base economically in many ways is still very, very strong in the United States. Even demographically, I think the decline is not as bad as we would have thought a couple of, of years back. But the paradox, this applies more to Russia than to China, is that Russia behaves as if it is still a great power. But if we take a closer look, they really are not. I mean, the fact that they are now stuck in Ukraine is kind of highlighting this. And as you mentioned before, I can only concur right, that, that, that the resistance, what the militarily also what the Ukrainians are achieving here is, is very impressive. This is probably the, the birth moment of a nation. Or, or if anybody doubted in the past that they're a nation, I think they now have proven it. Yeah. But if you take a close look, I think their economy is the size of Florida, right? Uh, most of it depends on, on resource exports. Uh, demographically, they have been in decline uh, so it's not as it was in the past, right? That the average Russian woman had five children and, and so the, the, the state could just send wave after wave into battle. Now it's less, you know, than 1.5 children. So that is worse. And even China, right? They have some domestic problems. So my question to you is, does this mean that the risk is even higher because they feel we are actually getting weaker so we have to move rather sooner right. than later? Or do you think that those weaknesses are kind of, um, you know, embellished for example, by me right now, and that in fact they are much stronger domestically than we think, and that they can also compete on these, you know, internal domestic factors, and not just as as powers that project uh, military force. So I think that's a great question. I think the short answer on the Russians is my sense is they're probably acting out of the sense that now is probably going to be better time to act than in the future. That's I mean not only for the demographic reasons, but you know. Putin and the Kremlin have spent a lot of money on restoring their conventional military. Europe hasn't. So this was, from a military point of view, probably a propitious time, as propitious time to act as they're going to find. Um, on the demographics, I mean, it's true that the Russians are facing these demographic trends, but so is everybody else, pretty much in Europe and, and across the OECD world, right? I mean, the United States is an exception uh, for a variety of reasons. But, you know, for instance, China's can age, but so is Taiwan, so is Japan, so is South Korea. The Southeast Asian countries are, are, are doing so more slowly, but they're also far less developed. So I think it's going to be a feature of, you know, developed life for good or ill. Um, I think generally probably for ill, but it is, it's the reality. And so it's more of a relative kind of question about, you know, um, you know, if, if the Russians are smaller, well, Germany and Poland are also smaller and, you know, Ukraine is smaller. And so how, how does that, you know, so, so if the Russians are maybe less willing to use their young men, maybe women, like, but so are the Europeans. So like, it, it, it's sort of, it's all relative, right? The other thing is that my impression of the Russians and having dealt with them a bit over the years is they are believed that they, they get more water from the rock, right? Or they, I mean, they, they get more sap from the tree in the sense that, I mean, yes, they're a smaller economy, but the, the, the state, and I suppose to some extent the people are just willing to dedicate a lot more in terms of their sacrifice, I mean, literally in their lives, but also their resources, their suffering to supporting the, the policies and, and activities of the Russian state. And so we'll see how that pans out right now. But I mean, of course, if you look at, at the Second World War, for instance, I mean, the United States was a much bigger economy, but the Soviets did so much, I mean, suffered so much more and ended up having this huge military that we were worried about too. So, you know, that was a long, that was a long time ago, but that is consistent with Russia's 
sort of historic traditions. And I think that's how their leadership thinks about things. So for instance, like the sanctions, probably the Russians, I mean, we'll see, who knows, but I would imagine that at least the Russian leadership thinks their people will put up with more than the Belgians would put up with, you know? And that's the sort of reality. The Chinese, they are facing demographic trends. I tend to be skeptical of prognoses that they're about to fall apart. Usually people with money seem to be thinking that they're not, <laughs> which is sort of like, if you have to put money to work, it's sort of like a think tank conceit. Um, but, you know, we'll see, who knows. Any kind of, as, as real as now, right, it's very much that there is at least a little bit always this idea right, that, that states are, for, for, are faced with certain challenges and it's almost independent of who is in power. But kind of in a, the last kind of segment of our conversation, of course, I, I need to ask something more provocative. What about the role of, of the, the statesman and I guess the, the stateswoman in, in all of this, right? If we, it's, it's almost like we ran an experiment and, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but if we only look at foreign policy and kind of we compare, you know, maybe let's, let's say George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and, and, and now Joe Biden, because I think these were at least, it wasn't, a, but there were at least different temperaments. Let, let's put mm -hmm. it this way. I mean, which one, I'm not saying you know which one was good or bad, but within a realist framework, a kind of or looking at the world, I'm more, I'm more interested in kind of how they acted and that's what they said. Right? right. I think this is always a kind of political rhetoric is one thing, but as you just said, I think it's the same with 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 that. You know, we are interested in what people actually do and not so much about what they they try to tell us. So if you look at the last 20 years of of U.S. foreign policy and, and U.S. grand strategy, I mean, I mean, at what time did you feel? in hindsight, right, more comfortable or less comfortable or felt that things were going into the right direction or were wrong turns or right turns were taken? Well, look, I, I mean, as, as we discussed, since I'm, I'm a realist, I, I look at results and consequences, right, not at rhetoric and kind of formal things. So, look, I think history will judge the Bush administration very unkindly. Um, I mean, when the United, when President Bush became, came into office in January in 2001, the United States was at the apogee of its power. I mean, we were by far the most, you know, healthy and dynamic and large economy. Our military power was totally unchallenged and our financial system was solid. Um, when he left office, we were embroiled in several major, you know, sort of and forever wars, if you will, in the Middle East. We had a, fin a financial, the most significant financial crisis since the Great Depression. And China had not only become immensely more powerful, but was increasingly obvious about it, especially after the financial crisis. Um, so that's not good. I mean, that's, and in, and in fact, it's very sad because actually candidate George W. Bush in 1999, 2000 was running on a very solid program. I mean, his military program was actually going to focus more on China. It was going to be more selective in its employment of military force. Um, you know, I think there was a, a move early in the administration around the EP3 incident to be firmer on China. Um, so it's it's a it's a tragedy, but I you know obviously he was profoundly influenced his administration profoundly influenced by 9/11, but but we cannot repeat that experiment. Uh, that was that was a you know just if you look again if you look at consequences, um, you know President Obama I disagree with very you know significantly on on probably most issues. I, I will say you know so I think Obama did not do well on the China account. Uh, there were elements in the administration that were trying that deserve a lot of credit, particularly in the Pentagon, um, particularly later in the administration, like Bob Work. But what, what I will say about President Obama is I think President Obama had, I, I always, he's, he has progressive preferences, but he's sort of prudentially realist. Um, he doesn't have the sort of offensive realist element, but I think, you know, I mean, even if you look at how he behaves as a politician, he's very calculating. He can be quite ruthless, actually, I think. Um, so in a way, I mean, some of his decisions, I mean, I don't think it made sense for us to get deeply embroiled in the Syria conflict, for instance. So I think he was right to be uh, cautious there. But, you know, he wasn't a thoroughgoing realist. I think he had, or at least his administration wasn't. I mean, some of the, the outreach to Iran, the view on, on China as a sort of, you know, that he, he was a bit of a minority in his, own, in his own administration. He's a kind of a sui generis figure. I mean, the Trump administration, I think, was successful in its foreign policy in the sense that it identified the core foreign policy problem, program, which had, problem which had been neglected at least for 10, probably 15 years, which was great power competition and particularly China, and not only identified it, but understood that there needed to be a confrontational approach. 
that, I mean, President Trump himself led, but also throughout the administration, because that was important both to push China back, but also to send a clear signal that we were serious, that it wasn't just words on a page. And so that's, um, and actually, you know, obviously there was a huge friction with the Europeans, but actually relationships with al uh, allies and partners in places like Asia and the Middle East were actually in pretty good shape. Um, uh, you know, there's the Abraham coalition, I would say relations with Japan, Taiwan, South Korea is difficult because that left wing government, Australia, other India was very good. So, I mean, obviously things could be done better, but I think that that from a foreign policy point of view and no new major military operations, which is great, both I don't like to get into new wars in general, but also we need to husband our power. And so President Biden, I, I don't think is doing well. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the, the shorthand I use is he, he talks like JFK, but he spends like Jimmy Carter in terms of defense, right? So JFK came into office saying, bear any burden, support any friend in, in the service of freedom. Now, I think that was a mistake that helped get us into Vietnam. I prefer Eisenhower and Nixon, but okay. But JFK also increased defense spending and he strengthened our conventional forces after the new look. Okay, that's at least rational, right? He was sending Green Beret into South Vietnam. He understood the importance that, yes, you need to speak at the ideological level and the high-minded rhetoric, but you also need to have the, the fist. Biden talks like that when he go into Munich a year ago. I mean, it's like, whoa, you know, it's like a, like a civilizational ideological conflict between democracies and authoritarians. And, but his defense budgets are small relative to, you know, previous expectations and so forth are lower. And I also don't think that maps to the world as it is. I mean, I think, I think the Europeans probably right now are more inclined towards that sort of thing, but, you know, the Germans and the French continue to make clear that they're not going to sign up for a new Cold War. I don't think that's what, you know, India, others, that's not what they want. And that's not the right way to think about it. There are elements of the Cold War that are helpful. I also think, look, I mean, I support the decision to get out of Afghanistan, but we have a right to expect that something like that is done more competently. I mean, we spend over 3% of our income in the United States on the national security state. That was a pathetic catastrophe. How did they not know that? Many of these people were going on vacation at that time. So I, I, I'm not one who likes to levy incompetence charges because usually that's a dodge for bad policy. And look, you know, people have reasonably disagree about what we should have done in Afghanistan. But if we, you know, we should have known and adapted accordingly. And that caused a lot of problems in terms, I think the main thing was the perception of the leadership of the United States. And that probably factored into Putin's assessment. And the fact that there's a war in Ukraine is it just, is a damning assessment of their foreign policy. And I, I find it actually, kind of reprehensible that they're even implicitly taking credit for what's happening in Europe as a response, because what's happening in Europe is a, re is a reaction to Putin's aggression. So are, is what they're implying that they deliberately allowed the worst humanitarian crisis since the Second World War in Europe in order to achieve their policy goals? First of all, that's false. Clearly they didn't. They didn't want a war. So I give them that credit, but then don't take, try to take credit for it. And, and I think this is a, this is a, I mean, it's good that Europe is standing up. And although I question its durability, like you do, I certainly hope we should maintain the pressure. But this is, called, this is also now a much more dangerous situation because the best time for opportunistic actors to move is when you know, their potential opponent, us, is potentially tied down or weakened. And that, you know, that, that risk has gone up. I mean, I, I'm not saying that it's going to happen in China, but if, 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 the, if the situation in Afghanistan happened and then Putin decided, I mean, it, it, you know, there's this debate about whether this would have happened under Trump. Well, it didn't. So QED, and like what I say is totally irrelevant. It doesn't matter. What matters is what the Kremlin decided. And the, the proof is there. And that leads me to worry that for whatever reasons Putin decided this was the propitious time, it might be a similar assessment in Beijing or for that matter in Tehran or in Pyongyang. And so that, you know, to me, there's going to be a lot, frankly, a lot of cleaning up after this. And this is a lot of the, I know a lot of these people, they're very competent, many of them, but I think they're frankly less than the sum of their parts. It's a very, um, it's sort of a very in the box administration in terms of the shibboleths of the, um, the post-Cold War world of the end of history kind of, you know, many of them, they know that military power is important, of course, they're not ridiculous, but they're not, they're not able, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm struck by how this administration combines a sort of the, the, this, this sort of, I, I guess, a kind of a weakness, but certainly a lack of hard power with an inflexibility. You know, what I think we need now is actually more like what, and I think a war could have been avoided with a more Kissingerian approach or Nixonian approach, which is 
don't mess with us, but we can be flexible. We're not necessarily going to tell, tell you exactly how, but there is a potential arrangement. And, and that's, you know, I mean, to me, again, to look at results, the results of their policy and their moralistic approach is the worst humanitarian. I mean, of course, it's Putin's culpability, it's his responsibility. But the point of, 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 state, of statecraft is to anticipate these threats and get ahead of them. And they manifestly failed to do that. I mean, this brings me, I don't know if, correct me if I'm wrong, was it Churchill? I mean, there's this quote from World War II, right? That, uh, that when, when Great Britain was, was fighting Japan and Germany, that I don't, I recall who it was, that we can, we can either fight one war yeah. or lose two wars. I don't exactly. know. If, yeah. yeah, we can win. I, I saw it recently, I've been using it. We can win one war or fight two or something. Yeah, like exactly. That. I think it's a paraphrase, but yeah. my view on Churchill quotes is if he didn't say it, he should have said that. So, yeah, right? pre precisely. <laughs> so we just give him credit because it sounds like something that he might say. Exactly, right. Yeah. So, so I, I, I fully understand and I think it's, it's very important when you say, right, the United States needs to make a decision strategically where they focus on. I said that you, you, they cannot simply buy, there is not enough, it would lead to overstretch. They cannot, they cannot uh, uh, play the... The, the, the role of sole protector for all of, all of the world. But what worries me domestically in the United States and also in Europe, you see this now a little bit, right? Also how, how the reaction is to Zelensky and the argument is, well, don't escalate in, in Ukraine, right? No, no fly zone, um, you know, be very careful because you don't wanna, wanna cause World War III a, a potential nuclear uh, conflagration, which I think is, is, a, is a justified argument. But as you said, right? I mean, the Chinese look at this as well and they say, okay, Russia is significantly weaker than we are, as you pointed out, but they seem by simply using the word nuclear, they seem to be very capable of deterring NATO and the West. How do we know that, that this will not then also be used kind of in case of a conflict over Taiwan, right? That kind of what you describe in your book where you, you do describe the military scenario that you, that you tend to avoid, but once it appears, right, you also kind of lay out how the kind of that, that you assume that the Chinese will be rational enough that they will not uh, escalate into, into nuclear war. I think Putin is also rational enough for that, but he knows that if he plays that card, like he's, he's, he has a receptive audience, right? That, that, that even the, the smallest risk of nuclear war, is, which I guess I agree with, but is too high. So if we, if we are deterred from, from intervening in, in Ukraine more forcefully, how do we know that the kind of deterrence that Russia does now with the West, the Chinese cannot also do with the West? Well, I do think we should be prepared to fight a nuclear war that stems from Taiwan in a way that I don't think we should be in Ukraine. I talk about how we do that. I wouldn't want to fight a, a total nuclear war, but I could imagine some elements of a nuclear war. And of course, so, as you know, in the book, the whole point is to not allow the Chinese to make the the war purely about Taiwan, but rather about something much larger that would be worth risking a very lar a large nuclear war over. I mean, Ukraine is outside of our defense perimeter, so I think it's a clear, I mean, whereas Taiwan is, is in it, um, that's different than our political relationship or, uh, and, and, and so forth and, and our political status towards Taiwan. Um, you know, I, I'm against a no-fly zone. I, I think, I don't think we should get in a direct conflict with Russia over, um, uh, over Ukraine, I think that um, you know, as you as you know from having read the book, I mean, I talk a lot about limited war in the book, and particularly limited war between two states with with survivable nuclear arsenals. And um, actually, I've gotten a lot of uh, flack from, it. frankly, a lot of it I think kind of superficial. But which is, you know, as you know, the basic logic I'm saying is like, okay, if you're going to prevent the Chinese from assuming this exactly what you're talking about, and then being emboldened to conduct aggression, we have to credibly be able to fight a war under the nuclear shadow. We don't want to fight a war under the nuclear shadow. I think it's a really bad idea. I would hate to have to do it, but if the alternative is just giving up over everything, we're going to get we're going to get owned, you know, as as you point out. So, um, uh, you know, in this context of how is a limited war conducted? Well, nobody's ever tried it. So we don't know uh, in terms of two nuclear armed superpowers. But my basic view, and I talk about this a lot in the book, is we should use sort of focal points and preferences or precedents. And this gets back to, you know, Thomas Schelling is one of the real influences of my thinking. And, you know, my basic rule here is if it happened in Vietnam, if the Soviets did it in, in Vietnam, it's probably okay. You know, we didn't escalate the war against Soviets. Did the Soviets give this, the North Vietnamese combat aircraft? Yes. So to me, that says, okay, MiG-29s are presumptively okay. We want to be careful about how we do it. I'd rather do it in a way that's deniable. And a lot of this is plausible deniability. 
this is why you have secret services. And I don't know what's going on, but like, let's not publicize everything, right? I mean, we knew the Soviets were supplying. I mean, the North Vietnamese weren't buying or building their own SAMs that were shooting down our aircraft that shot down John McCain and all these other guys uh, in Vietnam. And th so, I mean, in some sense, the Soviets killed 58,000 Americans in Vietnam. Like that, those were weapons manufactured in the Soviet bloc and they were supplying them with money. So obviously it was the Vietnamese fighting prowess and willpower. But I, my feeling on this is, you know, we should not be over deterred, but we should also take seriously. It is a goal to avoid World War III. And the other thing is that, um, you know, as you know, Putin has a lot of options below thermonuclear, general thermonuclear war. They have a large, they have a much larger battlefield arsenal than we do. And they can conduct brinksmanship below the level of uh, that thermo, large scale thermonuclear exchange in ways that would be very difficult for us to deal with because we've, we've gotten rid of a lot of our tactical nuclear arsenals. And the Ukraine is like actually beyond the tattered edge of our security perimeter. So if it becomes a contest and resolve, we're not in good shape. So I actually think we don't want to, we don't want to let, we don't want to give Putin a pretext to take it to that, to that level. Um, because that would be, that would be really, uh, uh, unfavorable for us. Whereas in a sense, actually, you know, looking at it purely from a geopolitical point of view, this is actually, why would we want to fundamentally change things? The Ukrainians are actually doing very well. Let's help them continue to do very well. The Russians are being frustrated. Now they don't have an excuse to make it about NATO. Say, oh, it was always the Americans in NATO behind the curtain. It was always about them. And that therefore, you know, changing the whole, uh, the whole, the whole dynamic. So I, I think that's how I would look at the situation. All right, I think this was a great concluding remark. Great. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time. This was extremely exciting and very enlightening. And uh, just uh, maybe a last question. Any, sure. any new works in, in the pipeline? Anything coming up? Well, I'm thinking about my next book. I'm, I'm, it's, it's a lot in flux because actually, uh, you know, and I don't want to seem flippant at all about what's, I mean, it's an enormous human, I mean, true human tragedy of just colossal proportions. But I mean, it is changing my own thinking about, because I think this probably will make the idea of great power competition, great power rivalry and its importance uh, less difficult to, to, to convince people of, right? I mean, so I think people can now see that not only great power competition, but actual major war is not just a thing of the past. So actually I was thinking of, of doing something that would kind of describe why particularly China is so consequential for Americans which still is a question out there, but I feel like a lot of this is kind of being proved both by what China itself is doing, but also what, what Russia is doing is saying this, the world is actually a pretty, things could get really out of hand. You know, I, I feel like that's less theoretical than it was three or four months ago. So I'm, I'm trying to think about that. And of course, the other thing is Europe is stepping up, thankfully, finally, the Germans and others, uh, of course, the Poles and the Romanians and so forth. Um, so that's changing, you know, where the need is. I mean, to me, this gives actually a real, very clear path forward, which is, which is we focus on Asia, we help Europe, but there's Europe uh, assumes more responsibility for its own defense, which it's capable of doing. And if anything, the poor Russian performance on the battlefield, as far as we can tell, only strengthens that, that, that assessment. So I'm, I'm thinking about that, but, but TBD. All right. I mean, I'll definitely make sure. I mean, I'll reach out to you again to come on. Great. Uh, but probably before the new book comes out. I think there is still <laughs> that could take a while. To talk yeah. about. This was great. Thank you so Thank much you, for Ralph. your time. Uh, have a great day and uh, hopefully we talk soon. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you. Wiedersehen.